Offbeat Cinema, brought to you by Mighty Taco. Enjoy the great taste anywhere at MightyTaco.com. Terrapin Station, the world's Grateful Dead headquarters at TerrapinStationBuffalo.com. Thinkers everywhere, welcome to Offbeat Cinema. You've arrived at the mad pad that we call the Hungry Ear. My name is Zelda, and as usual, I'm here with my two cohorts in our weekly cinematic deep dive, Theo and Bird. So hey guys, how are you today? Well, I'm as cool as, as cool can be, Zelda, because tonight we have truly a really cool film for you. This is kind of a classic featuring one of our favorite offbeat icons, the great John Agar. It's the brain from planet Eros. Yeah, 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 because, you know, like, the movie has inspired me to explore an entirely new dimension, you know, the dimension of the mind. Yeah, you know, I'm discovering <laughs> okay. that the power of the mind is truly limitless and, you know, like, did you know that I've only been using half of my brain? Really? I had no idea. Half, half your brain. So, so you're saying that on the left side nothing is right, and on the left, on the right side nothing is nothing's left? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, you know, in fact, hmm. I'm already deep in thought. For instance, you know, you wouldn't know it at first, but uh, you know. This coffee mug, it, it's, it's really smart. And, uh, okay, I've, I've got to know. Um, why do you say that, Bert? Because it's got a handle on everything. Ah, okay, anyway, boys. Well, let's get back to tonight's offbeat epic, The Brain from Planet Aris. This was released in 1957 and stars the great John Aker. And of course, uh, John was in lots of films and TV shows over many years, but he did get his start working with the, the truly brilliant film director, John Ford, uh, <laughs> in the Ford of I, I, I thought Ford only made cars and trucks. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Zelda, you want, you want to help me out? <laughs> okay, I'll try. Tonight's movie is all about gore. An evil giant floating brain that, of course, wants to conquer the world. So Gore perks it, perks its mind in the head of our hero, Steve March. Right, which gives Steve a, a heck of a headache and also some really, some really wild contact lenses. But then there's this other giant floating brain, Val, who wants to stop him or, or it from conquering the world. <laughs> Man, you know, it just sounds like this movie is totally out of its mind, you know, but I, I guess I'm gonna have to use both sides of my brain to watch it. Which makes it perfect for offbeat cinema, so let's dig it, shall we? From 1957, here's The Brain from Planet Aris. Thank you. 
checks out all right. I don't understand it. Hey, Dan, it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. I said it doesn't make any sense. The Geiger counter's been going on and off all morning, and the nucleometer checks right along with it. Oh, you talk like a man with rocks in your head. Radioactivity's a constant thing. Either it's there... Oh, yeah? Radon gas seepage? AEC checked this whole area two years ago. Couldn't be a plane flying over the bombing range with an atomic warhead. And not unless he's head chopping. Maybe just a blast of cosmic energy from the sun. Impossible. This stuff is coming from right there. Only 30 miles away. The base of Mystery Mountain. Or in the mountain itself. Anybody home? You know it's three o'clock and you mad scientists haven't even stopped for lunch? Oh, no wonder I've been getting insulting messages from my stomach. Hello, Sal. Something going on over at Mystery Mountain. On Mystery Mountain? The most godforsaken spot on the desert. Hasn't seen a human being since 1900 when the prospectors gave it up. Sure must be hot out there. Dad says he can't understand how the army missed building a base out there. It's so miserable. There it goes again. Look at that dial. 20 millirings. If I in for a square, that'd be... Dan, we're going over to Mystery Mountain. Well, not before we eat. No, I've got the fries down to a beautiful coal in the barbecue and... Well, you just have to eat. Come on. Oh, boy. I can hardly wait. Hey, Steve. We're gonna take a trip to Mystery Mountain. Can't we get Jim to take us over with a scintillator? That's the easy way. Nope, we're going in a Jeep. I don't want to scare away who's ever out there with a plane. Ah, for now, fly out into the patio or I'll never get this lunch together. What do you expect to find out there, Steve? A crank using an old mine for experiments? You got me. Spooks, gotta be spooks. Hey, what are you doing, incinerating them? I like mine pretty raw. Better feed him before he becomes violent. Go sit down, both of you. Hi, Mr. Fallon. Yeah, Dan, Steve. Hey, uh, if you like your hamburgers cremated, you're just in time. Well, thank you, Dan. Well, I didn't know we were having a party. Yeah, a little going away party for Steve and me. Making a trip, Steve? Just over to Mystery Mountain. What in the world would take you out there at this time of the year? It must be at least 120 in the desert. That's what I've been telling them. There's something going on over there. Open the door for me, will you please, Dan? Well, you can't just leave me there, Steve. Go on. It's a hot blast of gamma coming from Mystery Mountain. That's cause enough for any scientist to go into the desert. Lucky it's intermittent. If it was constant, we'd be fried. Oh, either way we get fried. By a gamma ray or a jeep ride across a desert at 120 in the shade. Which the nearest of is 20 miles away. All right, Danny boy. If you feel delicate, I'll go alone. What, and get lost? Oh, please remember, Steve, I'm your brain. Don't make a move without me. Have you any idea what it could be, Steve? No, that's what we're gonna find out. Give me some onions, will you, Sally? The way Dan's piling them on, I'm gonna have to eat some in self-defense. How long do you expect to be gone? Three or four days, if the spooks don't get us. Don't you think you ought to notify the AEC, Steve? No, not till we find out first. Mm, curiosity. I know, kills cats. We've got 18 lives between us. <laughs> and no more hamburgers. I guess we can't make it any further in the Jeep. I suppose we're about to pick up our gear and walk from here. You suppose right. Try the scintillator, will you?
couldn't be deader. Recorded this morning, you saw it. This water tastes like weak tea. It's practically boiling. Well, I'll be darned. Take a look at this. A little more than halfway down and to the left. What do you see? A pile of rocks. Wasn't there last winter. Come on, Dan. It's not far. Daylight's about to run out on us. Boy, when I think I could have studied accounting and worked in an air-conditioned office. Bet eight to five against it. We bet. Over here. Dan, look at this cave. It's just been blasted out recently. That explains that pile of rocks. Take a look at those markings. Yeah. Somebody's going to a lot of trouble. And they had to have a good reason. No. Nobody's been in there. There are no footprints anywhere. Let's take a look inside. It's probably full of beer cans. Find anything, Steve? Dead end. Steve? That way. Get out of here. See that? Flash, of course. I'm walking in here with my eyes shut. Turn the Geiger on again, will you? It is on. Suddenly it's cool as a well digger's foot. There was radioactivity in here before we saw it. Toss your light, Dan. See that glow? Yeah. Somebody's in that passage. Get the rifle ready. Take it. No. Come on. Hello in there. We're friends. Come on out. My friend. 
and turn off his flashlight. And he's social. We go in after him? We're coming in. We don't want any trouble. But we're armed, in case you are. Beatniks. Looking for offbeat cinema swag? We've got it. T-shirts, 20 ounce classic coffee mugs, hats, more hats, stickers, and more. Man, like this is commercialism. Cats, do we have offbeat cinema swag? Well, as a matter of fact, we do. Get with the in crowd. Order your offbeat cinema merchandise today. Just go to offbeatcinema.tv for details. from Steve or Dan for a whole week. You know them. They get real carried away if they find anything unusual. Yeah, huh? Jim called, and if it's all right with you, we're going up to Mystery Mountain this afternoon. Mm-hmm. Surprise them. All right, Dad, I'll see you about one. I'll have lunch ready for you. Okay. Bye-bye. Steve! The prodigal returns. Glad to see me. Am I? <laughs> you two have been up at Mystery Mountain a whole week. <sighs> you know what we found? Absolutely nothing. What's the matter? You never kissed me like that before. Wow. I never missed you so much before. You should stay away more often. Where's Dan? Oh, you know Dan. Playboy at heart. One week in the mountains, and he has to go to Las Vegas to recuperate. What's the matter, Steve? Nothing's the matter. But, are you different? I don't know what you mean, different. I'm still the same old lovable character I always was. Excuse me, Sally. What happened out there? Tell me. Nothing, Sally. Now, not... Don't you worry your pretty little head about it. No. Not until you've told me the truth. I'm Sally, remember? The girl you're going to marry. 
I know you, Steve. And I know when there's something wrong. I don't know what you're talking about. If you mean that... that pain I had... It was just a tooth kicking up. Come here. You're a spook, you know it. Getting all fired up just because I don't explain a toothache. You acted funny. And that way you kissed me. Like that? It makes my toes tingle. You've got to see a doctor. Don't expert me, Sally. I'm all right. George. George, he didn't mean it. Something's the matter with Steve. What happened to him out there? Sally? Dad. Dad. What is it? What's the matter? It's Steve. Something happened to Steve? I don't know. He, he was here just an hour ago. I can't explain it to you. He, he was changed. I think he was ill. He, he looked like he... Why, I just can't tell you. It was awful. You think he's ill? No. No, he never looked better, but... it was as if he was a stranger. I'll talk to Dan. He'll know whatever it is is bothering Steve. I wouldn't worry. Steve says Dan went to Las Vegas. I don't believe it. It's not like Dan. There's something wrong. Did it ever occur to you that Steve might have something on his mind? Well, I'll run to the lab and see if I can help. If I were you, I'd put another place on the table. Your door anymore? 
I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear you knock. I can only stay a minute. Steve, something's the matter between you and Sally. What is it? Oh, nothing really. Sally's just a little upset with me for staying away so long. She'll get over it. It's more than that, Steve. I know Sally pretty well by this time. She's worried about you. Why didn't you come back to the house with me and have lunch with us? Well, I'd like to. I'd like to come over and talk to you about... <laughs> I can't come over now. Will you please leave? Of course. That's what you want? That's what I want. Steve, I think you're ill. May I call Dr. Parker for you? No. Mind your own business. Will you get out of here? worried at all about Steve, Dad? Of course I am, Sally, but Steve's a grown man. He has his problems. We all have. But I'm in love with him. We're going to be married. Well, don't you think we should do something if he's sick? Sally, I don't like to interfere in other people's affairs. Steve is terribly upset by something. If he wanted to take me into his confidence, he would. But if you could have seen the way he acted here this afternoon, you'd... Well... Well, I can't explain it to you, Dad. Something terrible has happened to Steve. And what's more, I don't think Dan is in Las Vegas. It, it isn't like Dan just to suddenly disappear like that. Well, what do you want to do, Sally? I'm willing to try anything, if it'll help. Well, whatever happened to Steve happened on Mystery Mountain. I'd feel a lot better if we could go there to see if we can find the answer. It's a terrible trip this time of the year. I know. But just the same, I'd like to make it. Tomorrow. Well, I've spoiled you too long to try to stop now. We'll leave tomorrow morning. You get the food and water, and I'll get the other gear. Thanks, Dad. I don't know what we'll find out there. But at least we'll be trying. Cats. Welcome back to Offbeat Cinema. Tonight we are presenting some cinematic food for the thought in uh, the form of the brain from Planet Iris. Now this film was released back in 1957 which was a, a big year for these kind of whacked out sci-fi flicks. I mean that year alone we had Invasion of the Saucer Man and the Incredible Shrinking Man and the Black Scorpion and the Invisible Boy and a bunch more. It was a very busy year at the, at the drive-in for all those cats and chicks, and some of them may even have watched the movie, because <laughs> they're pretty good, some of these films. They really are. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's all true, true truth, Theo, but I've got something that no drive-in could ever match. A roof? <laughs> oh, it's our viewer mail. Oh, better than a roof. That's right, boys. It's time for our favorite part of the show. And when we turn things over to all of you out there in the dark, mm -hmm. and we have some pretty terrific uh, mail this week. We Let's do. Who wants to start? Well, I got a sweet letter from a fellow uh, from all the way over in Grand Rapids who uh, uh, opens a letter with, hi, OBC, using the word H-I-G-H, so uh, <laughs> uh, stick that in your pipe <laughs> that, and smoke that it. That actually kind of um, works, yeah. Uh, he wants us to look up a show, the really great movie from 1960, The Time Machine, uh, by, there's a lot of greats going on here, the great Orson Welles. Well, it's not exactly Orson Welles, it's it's H.G. Welles. Well, I'm going to give uh, but, uh, Stephen a pass because he's absolutely, 70. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Stephen is 70 and he, he may be high, um, <laughs> but you know, the other thing I know about um, uh, Orson Welles and A.C. Welles, they're often mixed up with Don Welles. That's true. It often happens, it's true, but yeah. <laughs> um, Stephen saw this movie when he was nine, and he still remembers it, 
and he characterizes the feeling as that that movie filled his little boy pants up. Nice. So uh, we're just gonna <laughs> thank you very much and say keep keep watching something, Stephen. Oh, that's okay. a great memory. Yeah. What we're a gonna great try memory. for that film from the vault. All well, all thanks, Steve. All's well all that ends, ends well. well. Thank all's you, right. well right. the world. Trying to get it out. And we know Don Wells. She's Martini's wonderful. Talking that's about. right. We love Don Wells. We love Don She's Wells. a very sweet lady. We, yes. We've never met Orson or H.G. Uh, Not anyway. yet. Um, this is a postcard, and it's a very hip postcard, a black and white um, illustration. Anyway, um, this is from a cat, oh, two cats, Lisa and Mitchell Weinberger, and it's, it's simply Zelda Theo Bird, thanks for the great entertainment, and all the best to you and your friends. Well, thank you. Thank oh, you so nice. much, Lisa. Thank you so much, Mitchell. We dig, we, we dig these mm -hmm. um, postcards. Keep sending cats. We love them. And I have a really nice letter here. This is uh, this is from Ms. Uh, Denaria. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If not, forgive me. Ms. Fernandez. She's uh, new, writing to us from New York, New York, on state. And she says, "To the coolest beatniks on earth." I guess that's us. Um, he's. Uh, I'm sorry. Just one second. Here. She would like to get an autographed poster or postcard, which we can do, we can do easy we can enough. Do that. And uh, she even wrote a small poem for us. Oh! So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this real quick. It's called Final Frontier. Stars shine that in the, stars that shine in the celestial sky, comets and meteors flying high, planets spinning, space dust floating. Look at that, another galaxy forming. Wow. That's pretty cool. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. I maybe you know I'm looking at this. It might be Donaria. Donaria. We don't know. We that's don't know. And I, you know what I failed to mention too that this was name. from uh, Tucson, Arizona. So we have New York City, Tucson, Arizona, and, and Grand Rapids, Rapids, Michigan. Wow. Nice We're all over the place. Oh yeah. I'm, well, cats, we love getting your cards. We love your letters and posts. So please check us out all around social media. Give us a like on Facebook, plus you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Ow, I just and, my and we <laughs> are still very old school because we dig it when we get these letters handwritten from you with your comments, film suggestions, and favorite recipes. So send it to the address that's on the screen right now. And of course, please check out our official online Offbeat Cinema store, Mad Swag, where you can, you can get t-shirts, uh, Offbeat Cinema hats, even a really smart offbeat cinema mug just just like this one. Can you handle that one? <laughs> and you can find that on our website, which is www.offbeatcinema.tv. Yes, yes. But now we need to get back to tonight's brainy feature on offbeat cinema. The brain from Planet Ours. Dig it. <laughs> the end of the line to the car anyway. Look, Dad, they're canteen. Jeep tracks, too. Must have walked down the mountain from here. Get the water, I get the flashlight. Okay. Careful, honey. This is no place to rest. At least there's shade in that cave over there. I 
cave? I've been out here with Steve before, and I know that cave wasn't here. Come on, it's just a step. The cave wasn't here. All right, Sally, I believe you. But I don't see how all this rock could have been blasted from the mountain without us knowing about it. This passage goes back as far as my light will reach. I'm telling you, Dad, it wasn't here. Or Steve or I would have seen it. You know Steve. The rock isn't even discolored. You're right, Sally. This cave was blasted open within the last two weeks of the outside. Reflecting. Sally, it's me. We better get out of here. Oh, no. No, something in there happened to change to you. And I'm going to find out what it was. Earthlings. Who? What are you? Do not be afraid. I am a friend. I am not of your earth. My name is Paul. I am from the planet Eris. I was sent here by my leader to capture the criminal Gore who escaped from Eris to your planet Earth. He has already voided that human in the passage. He is cunning and dangerous. I need your help. What can we do? Do you know the dead one's companion? Yes, he's a very good friend. He has been behaving strangely? Yes, he has. His body has been taken over by this criminal I seek. If you have regard for your friend, not a word of this meeting to anyone. Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, I will appear at your home. We will make our plans then. do as the thing says. We have no choice. Yes, this is Steve March. I'd like to speak to Colonel Frogley, Atomic Energy Headquarters, Indian Springs. Could you put me through, please? Hello, Colonel. Steve March. Yeah, you're right. I'm calling in connection with those tests you planned this week. Oh, just small ones, eh? Well, I'd still like to be there as an observer. 
Friday. All right. I certainly appreciate this, Colonel. I'll be there. Goodbye, sir. So Friday, the savages are going to play with their new toy. Gola will be there <laughs> as an observer. I'm going to demonstrate something Friday. I have a surprise for them. Helplessness is your best friend, savage. When I am occupying your body, or in my present transitory form, I am without substance and indestructible. You are fortunate that Gore, one of the greatest intellects in a world where intelligence is all, has chosen to use your body. I, Gore, in your stupid body, will have power, life, or death over this civilization. Through me, you shall have power such as no man has ever seen before in the history of your planet. The power of pure intellect. Dad. Please be seated. I come to you on the friendliest of missions. What do you want us to do? You can help me save the Earth from a terrible experience. Yes, the whole Earth. Gore is insane for power. That's why he came to Earth when he escaped from Eris. You are a weak and new civilization. With Gore's power and his ambition, he could rule it. How can you stop him? I will have to force him out of the body of your friend to take him back to Eris for his punishment. If I cannot, your friend will have to give his life to save the world. But why should Steve have to die? Well, we will try to save him. Now I need a host, an Earth body. Take mine. No, Sally. I'd like to help. Let me explain. Once I'm in your body, I will be in complete control of your thoughts, your movements, your life. I must have your complete agreement, very complete cooperation in every way. I agree. I will need a body that will be inconspicuous and constantly around Gore. Think it over carefully. Perhaps the young lady would be the best. George. What about George? The dog. He is intelligent, devoted, strong. And he's always a Steve and me. female for a ride in your car. I will enjoy being you tonight. She gives me a very strange, very new elation. and I let my daughter put herself in the hands of this thing. How long must this go on? Only until I can capture Gore outside of Steve's body. 
No harm shall come. Are you sure? I have powers that equal and surpass the powers of Gore. Here he comes. Remember, we must do nothing to make Gore suspicious. You must treat Steve as you've always treated him. But how can I? I'm scared to death of him. You must find strength. sweater on. I got the top top. All right. Hello, George. Come on, boy. Put your feet up. Come on. Come on, fella. How are you, mutt? <laughs> so Dan decided to visit the flesh pots. Uh, yeah. John, about, uh, about that scene the other day. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. It's forgotten. We all have a bad days. I, uh, I guarantee it'll never happen again. If you can forgive me, I... I was mad at Dan. He ran out on me in the midst of a very important experiment. I don't know. Things just piled up. Forget it, Steve. Forget it. It never happened. But I am glad to see you in your usual good humor. All set, Master? Let's go. <laughs> well, you want to go, Georgie? All right, you can go. If you promise not to drive. <laughs> Have a good time, kids. I'm, I'm really digging this flick, but that, that Gore, you know, he calls himself uh, one of the greatest intellects from the world where intelligence is all. I mean, come on, talk about having a big head. <laughs> well, technically, it is pretty big in this film, Barb. Well, you know, speaking of big heads, I've been studying all about the power of the mind. Like, check out this LP, The Basic Principles of Kreskin's ESP. I mean, like, Listening to this cat has really broadened my mind. Now, now, Bird, you, you, you do know what ESP stands for, right? Yeah, of course. Extrasensory prevention. Uh, actually, it's perception. Yeah, but you know, I think in Bird's case, that, that, that might work better. <laughs> well, I, I think this Kreskin cat is amazing. Well, Bert, the amazing Kreskin is a legend and he's been entertaining audiences for decades with his mental skills. Mental skills, huh? Well, you know, if you ask me, I think it's all in his head. <laughs> anyway, in tonight's film, uh, I like the fact that Steve's fiance is just sitting there, you know, sitting around doing nothing. She's actually doing something about it. She, she visits the space brain in the cave and then has him over to the house the next night. Which, you know, that's my kind of chick. Right <laughs> well, cats, well, Bird practices broadening his mind and Theo practices doing whatever it is he does. I think it's time to get back to Gore and Val and company in tonight's offbeat epic, The Brain from Planet Ours. That's our world out there, Sally. Yours and mine. Really? All of it? If you want it. You've been out in the sun a lot today with no hat on? I can give it to you, believe me. You've turned into a regular caveman. You see a difference in me, eh? I am different, Sally. And the whole world's going to know how different by next Friday. I'm going to the atomic bomb test in Indian Springs. I'm going to watch the test with Colonel Frogley and Professor Tate. And then I'm going to introduce my discovery. It'll make the atomic bomb look like a firecracker. You frighten me when you talk like that. It's true. 
I've discovered a power that's going to make me the most feared man on earth. Is that what you want? Power? That's what everyone wants. That's why the office boy wants to be the boss. That's why the private wants to be the general. Power? <laughs> and I've got it. I wish you'd tell me what you're talking about, Steve. It doesn't make any sense. I can't. Don't, Steve. Steve! You think you can get away from me? You can't. Don't! I want you, Sally. For what I want, I take. No! I... I kind of got carried away out there, didn't I? Yes, you did. Do any good to say I'm sorry? You know I love you, Steve. But I hardly knew you tonight. Forget it. If you want me to. Thanks. What are you going to do Friday, Steve? I'm going to the atomic test as an observer. You can forget all that crazy talk. All right. Forget all about tonight, will you? Okay. The plane, a worldwide liner with 38 passengers aboard, simply exploded in midair, according to eyewitnesses. The wreckage is high on the side of Mount Almogordo. Rescue parties are now on their way to the scene of the tragedy, although there is little hope that any of the victims will be found alive. Mount Almogordo. It's only 20 miles away. We might be able to help. You! A couple of you men up there, give him a hand with his litter. Turn that light over here. Get that light over here. Take Another body now. coming over the hill, Colonel. Good, bring him right up here. Take it easy, take it easy. Get the door. Turn that light back on, down here. Colonel Hawk, anything we can do? Still some bodies missing. Well, we were driving a few miles away, heard the broadcast. Hold it right there, fellas. This is not for you, miss. They all look like that? You ever see anything else that flash burns so violently? All right, man. I want to show you something else. I brought Professor Tate from Indian Springs over with me. He's been testing the only piece of metal we could find so far. The plane exploded over 100 acres. Oh, hi, Steve. Hello, Dale. Radiation? Well, it seems almost certain, yet there's no contamination. I've never seen anything like this before. Now, what we're telling you is in strict confidence, Steve. We don't want to start a panic. Better take this piece and get it over to Indian Springs lab. Steve, see you later. Bye, Dale. I couldn't help hearing what he said, Steve. It was terrible. Could be the beginning of the end. What do you mean? You heard what he said. That accident was caused by something we've never seen before. What did cause it? The professor's right. It was caused by a power from outside of this world. Do you really believe that, Steve? There's nothing else to believe. Why would it do a thing like that? To demonstrate its power over the Earth? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to frighten you with my theories, hon. If your theories were true, we'd be at the mercy of this thing. Yes. 
such a creature could rule the whole world. Oh, Dad. It was awful. We went to the plane crash, and those people were burned just the way Dan was. It was that thing that possesses him that did it. Now, Sally, this is a time for thinking and planning, not crying. I know, I know. There must be some way to stop it. It will not be an easy task. Gore is not vulnerable while he is in the body of the human or in his transitory stage. Only when he is in his true form can he be killed or captured. Can a human kill him at such a time? It is possible. In his true state, a heavy blow on the point known to your surgeons as the Fisher of Rolando can kill. Is there any special time when Gore might assume such a, a state? In Earth's atmosphere, we must return to our true state once every 24 hours in order to assimilate enough oxygen for life. If we could tell Steve of this Fisher of Rolando. That is very dangerous. It would have to be done when Gore was not inhabiting the body. If Gore even suspected your friend of having this information, he would kill him immediately. There must be some answer to this horrible situation. Perhaps the army... The army could do no good. Then what are we supposed to do? Just sit and wait. I love him, Dad. Do you understand? I, I just can't leave him alone when he needs help. You can't help him, Sally. Nobody can. Come in. Hello, Steve. Hello, Wiley. What's the law doing out in a night like this? Drove over and talked to you. Oh, sit down. I'll pour you a cup of coffee. All right. What have I done? Oh, record nothing, Steve. Just got some questions I want to ask you. Oh, about the plane accident? I was there. No, it was about Danny Murphy. Dan? Is he in trouble? Well, it depends on the way you look at it. He's dead. Dead? What happened? I was hoping you could tell me, Steve. Found his body in a cave on Mystery Mountain. You went out there with him, didn't you? Yeah, I came back with him. He said he was going to Las Vegas. Yeah. So I understand. He did an autopsy on Dan's body, Steve. He never made it to Las Vegas. Oh, he said he was going. Yeah. Autopsy showed he'd been dead since the day you two went out there. Doc put the cause of death as burns. Said his body was cindered. Just like the bodies in that plane wreck. I don't reckon you know too much about that. But there's more to this business in the cave than you've told me. Planning on arresting me, Sheriff? Well, yeah, I might. On what grounds? You lied about Dan. Said he was in Las Vegas when all the time you knew he was dead. That's grounds enough. You and he are also mighty fond of that Fallon girl. You're in a little trouble, Steve. Oh, no, I'm not. You're the one that's in trouble. Yeah, I killed Dan. I killed those people in that plane, too. And now I'm gonna kill you. I'm taking you in, Steve. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> enough to do this must have been caused by some sort of an A-blast. 
but there's uh, no radioactivity. What do you make of it, Professor Tate? Well, the burns are unlike those of uranium or cobalt-60 or any other daughter product we know of at present. Then there's only one answer. We have been invaded. Not the United States, but the world has been invaded. Fantastic. Not so fantastic, gentlemen. We're talking of invading the moon. Our job is to find out who the invaders are and try to work with them. We're certainly helpless against them. Well, what about the atomic test tomorrow at uh, Indian Springs, Colonel? I've had a conference call with my colleagues. We can see nothing to be gained by delaying the test. The proximity of the plane disaster to the testing grounds convinces us that the invaders are in that area. The tests may be instrumental in bringing them out into the open. Physician's report from Indian Springs. The condition of the bodies recovered from the plane crash is identical with that of the nuclear scientist Dan Murphy, killed at Mystery Mountain. Death by intense radiation. Gentlemen, gentlemen. The knowledge we have must be treated as top secret. We want no panic. Only key personnel in your units will be briefed on our suspicions. We should move at once to Indian Springs and prepare for any emergency. Come on, George, get up. Come on, boys. Hey, you got company. Sally, can't leave no you're frightened. Always at mealtime. You can smell meat and potatoes clear out to your lab. I came by for that. And to return your beast, George. Came over to visit me last night. Almost stayed me out of house and home. Hello, John. Hello, Steve. As long as you're here, won't you stay for a bite to eat? Well, I plan to. Got to go home early, though. Big day tomorrow at Indian Springs. Just got the weather reports. Perfect for the tests. Gonna be a lot of brass there. That's good. I want to talk to him about some ideas I've developed. <laughs> Got some surprises for him. Well, uh, I'll go get dinner ready. So the experiments are going well. You've worked hard, Steve. You deserve some recognition. I'll get it tomorrow. You giving out any hints, or do I have to wait with the rest of the world? Uh, no hints, John. Well, maybe uh, one hint. I'll tell you this much. I'm going to give a demonstration tomorrow that'll create as much excitement as the bombing of Hiroshima. Not much left for George. Come on, boy, sit up. Now, that was a good dinner, Sally. Don't sound so surprised. Well, I'm going to the den and get to work before the dishwashing starts. Every silver lining has a dark cloud. <laughs> Guess I'm stuck. That's what I want for my birthday, a dishwasher. Well, I'll see you after the dishes are washed. Oh, you don't have to help me, Steve. I know you're in a hurry to get home. Uh, I'll wash them twice the next time. Won't be long now, hon. And you'll be Mrs. Steve March. Okay? You know it is. You like living in Washington. Washington? Yeah, servants and everything your little heart desires. We're going to be rich. Mm, richer than that. Pictures in the paper, royalty calling on you. You scare me when you talk like that, Steve. <laughs> you don't believe me. Of course I don't. I know you're just kidding. But you kid too much. It's, it's becoming an obsession, all this power and money. Who needs it? I do. And you will, too. It's habit-forming, Sally. The, the more you get, the more you want. You'll see what I mean tomorrow. I don't understand you anymore, Steve. What's going to happen tomorrow? What is it that's going to make all this difference? <laughs> You'll just have to wait and see. Love me? You know I do. Gonna marry me? Mm-hmm. No matter what happens. I can't think of anything that would keep me from loving Steve March.
You're more important to me than anything, Sally. You know that. That's the way I feel about you, Steve. Only you've suddenly got a yen for power and money. I guess there's nothing strange about that. Not for a man who's in love with the most wonderful girl in the world. I want those things for you, you silly little idiot. Now, don't get started on that again. Okay, you don't want to be rich and famous. All right, powerhouse. So you don't want to do the dishes? Get going. I've got to keep my mind on my work. See you tomorrow on my way home from Indian Springs. Okay. Steve, glad you got here. Hello, Colonel. I understand you have a lot of brass out here for the test today. We have. We also have a very serious situation, Steve. There's a top drawer meeting scheduled. Oh, here they are right now. General Brown. I'm sure you've heard of Dr. Steve March. He's been conducting experiments in nuclear fission on a grant here in the desert. Steve, General Brown. How do you do? I'm afraid, March, that this meeting is top secret. I uh, understand, General. The Colonel was just telling me. However, before the meeting starts, I'd like to have a few words with you, gentlemen. I promise you I won't waste your time. Well, I'm afraid the business we have at the moment is more important, March. Come along, Colonel. I'm sure it isn't, General. This meeting is about the mysterious explosion of the passenger plane and the radiation burning of my assistant, Dan Murphy, isn't it? I can explain those deaths if you and the rest of the gentlemen will give me a few moments of your time. All right, two minutes. Sit down, sit down, gentlemen. Gentlemen, before I can ask you to take what I have to say seriously, I want to show you something. This is the closed circuit television set focused on the test area, isn't it? Yes. And uh, these buildings and equipment have been placed in the desert for destruction by the atom blasts? That's right. Would you all kindly watch the screen? down that plane? I did. And you've killed your assistant with this power? I did, and I'll kill anybody else that interferes with my plans. Get out of your chair, Frogley, and let the Jenna sit down. Sit down, General. I know what you're all thinking, that I must be destroyed. Uh, but I can't be destroyed. And any attempt by any means to do so will bring forth reprisals that will shock the whole world. I hope that will be sufficient proof that I am to be dealt with in a sensible manner. 
Now these are my orders to you. In 10 hours at exactly 8 o'clock tonight, I want to meet with authorized representatives from the United States, England, France, Russia, China, and India. I will state my proposition at that time. Any country I've mentioned that does not have a representative with full power to act, present in this room at that time, will find its capital city completely wiped out at 10 minutes past that hour. But that isn't enough time. But that's all the time you have. General, what are we going to do? Let's right get in touch with Watson. Hello, operator. Give me the White House, please. Yes, this is General Brown. Boy, am I beat. That meeting this morning knocked the stuffing out of me. Yeah, I'm sorry, General. Well, 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 I'm sorry, and you can't tell me anything about it. You'll read about it in the papers. When I'm rich and famous? Yeah. Like maybe tomorrow. So quick? You know me when I get going. I'm a fireball. You know, operator, it looks like you could use a nap before the evening's festivities. Will you wake me in time to dress? Sure. 6.30. That'll give you plenty of time. Oh, it's uh, 5.10 now. You better get some sleep. He's asleep. He has to be at the meeting at 8. Gore is tired because he has had no opportunity to return to his true form for oxygen. He will be over the 24-hour period. Yes? He will be very vulnerable. You mean that spot near the top of the brain known as the, uh, the fissure of Orlando? You have a good memory. You'll have to hurry. Come on, wake up. Mm. Enough time for that much. Right now, you have to get going. Oh, browbeater. Oh, loyal friend, that's what I am. Now, get going. You know, it's over an hour's drive to Indian Springs. You want to be late for your big occasion? Uh, okay, okay, you win. Oh, boy, am I tired. I've got my orders. Out. <sighs> See you tomorrow, Sal. Not tonight? I'm going straight home after the meeting. I'm beat. No, George, you can't go this time. Come on. Come on, George, get out. that your government is prompt enough to save its capital city. Uh, Moscow, isn't it? My country, the Soviet, ordered me to come. We do not believe in miracles. I am here merely as an observer. Are there any doubters in the group? Is it possible that you want me to demonstrate my powers by wiping out your capital city? As one of the two delegates in this room that attended your demonstration this morning. I would like to assure the other delegates at this table that there is absolutely no doubt of your power to destroy. I saw it. I saw an American colonel killed, burned to a crisp by radiation with one look from this man after the officer had fired at him point blank with no effect. I saw him wipe out a city of concrete and steel and a hundred tanks, trucks, guns without leaving this room by some power of mind. Gentlemen, I am convinced, my government's convinced, 
And my advice to you and to your governments is to take what this, this man says as a most serious matter. Thank you, General. Oh, I see we still have some skepticism on some of our guest faces. Would you gentlemen kindly step to the window? Now! Can you see that plane in the sky? I see the plane. Watch it. <laughs> Perhaps we can get back to the meeting without any more skepticism. Now, this is my plan. I want all of your uranium, plutonium, all your atomic resources. I want your factories, railroad shipping, all of your industrial facilities. Your workers will labor around the clock, day and night, following my blueprints to build the most powerful invasion force ever gathered in the universe. You mean to enslave the world? Russia would never agree to it. There's a simple answer to that. There'll be no Russia. Your United Nations building will be turned over to me. I will teach your engineers to build a fleet of interplanetary rockets to be armed and manned by your joint military forces, all under my command. What would you do with all this power? I will return to my planet Eris. And through its vast intellect, I will become master of the universe. After I'm gone, your Earth will be free to live out its miserable span of existence as one of my satellites. And that's how it's going to be. That'll be all for now, gentlemen. I will preside over a meeting at the United Nations building at 10 o'clock in the evening, day after tomorrow. You will all be there. After all, you have no other choice, have you?
you are unable to grasp the importance of today's events. You are about to succeed where Caesar, Napoleon, and Hitler have failed. Through me, you will have ruled the world, but I will rule the universe. <laughs> You will be dictator of the world in spite of yourself. While I am on this earth, you and Sally and I will live in a splendor such as the world has never known. Heavens, I found your note. How did you... How did you happen to know about the fissure of Rolanda? Paul. Paul? Oh, that's right. You don't know about him. He's another brain from planet Eris. He was watching over you and George's body. George! Steve, what you told me about Gore. Ball? And George, speak to me. You and your imagination. I knew a bartender who was a mind reader. Oh? Yeah, I was there one night, and a horse walked into the bar, and the bartender looked at him and said, hey, and the horse said, you read my mind. Ha, I, I bet that was the same bartender who then asked him, <laughs> why the long face? Yeah, I think that was Okay, it. that was unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, man, that was one exciting finish to this flick, baby, I mean, you know, that gore really did have a big head. You know, uh, you and Sally and I will live in splendor such as the world has never known. <laughs> then Steve goes in for the ax and cuts him down to size. Yeah, I'd like to see the Hollywood big boys try something that cool. Yes. Huh, well, before we leave tonight, I think we need to show some love to John Agar for his performance in this film. That's right, Zelda, because, you know, this cat went from working with uh, John Ford and John Wayne in classics like Fort Apache and She Wore a Yellow Ribbon to fighting a giant floating space brain on a string, buddy. But, <laughs> but even so, you know, he, he really brings it all to the part, and, and I think that's the sign of, of, of a real actor. Yeah, yes, and, and also I think I'm, I'm gonna leave the mentalism to uh, experts like the amazing Kreskin, you know, because personally I just don't see a future in it. And that's probably the safest thing for everyone. But I do have one more prediction, <laughs> that all you cats out there on the other side of this screen, <laughs> you're gonna join us again for another episode of Offbeat Cinema. Ah, that's one I think we can all agree on. So cats and chicks, keep those cards and letters coming. And whatever you do, wherever you are, keep watching the sky. Keep watching the sky.
And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.